If you've got Jesus, how could you want more? That's the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church Choir singing I Got Saved, more music from our 2024 Winter Revival that we're going to be featuring for at least a couple more weeks. And then we'll bring out some even newer music for you, but they do a great job with all of that. And uh, I Got Saved, what a great song. Good evening. And welcome to Tuesday Night Prophecy for Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. I'm Dr. Joseph Speciali. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us in our our weekly uh, Bible study on prophecy as we're going verse by verse through the book of Daniel. And I know you could be doing a number of different things other than listening or watching us, so we appreciate that, and it is a testimony to your love for the Lord and His Word. A couple of announcements before we go to the Lord in prayer. We know Easter Sunday is coming up. Easter is early this year, March 31st, and at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, we're having uh, another uh, rendition of our Easter play. I think we've done this now three years consecutive, I believe. Um, something like that, but we are going to be having our Easter play uh, on Palm Sunday. Sunday, March 24th at 6.30 at the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. The play's uh, entitled Watch the Lamb, and I'd like to encourage each and every one of you who don't have a home church that live in the Elkview, West Virginia area, if you don't come and join us before that date, come on out Sunday night okay, to watch the play. And I'm sure that uh, it will have a positive impact on your heart and life. If Even if you're not in the Elkview, West Virginia area, even if you're a member of another church, we encourage you to catch the play. Uh, I think we're going to be live streaming it. It will also be recorded and placed on the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church Facebook page. If that changes, I'll let you know, okay? But I believe that is the case. So you'll be able to catch the play online at your leisure, and we encourage you to do that. A lot of time and effort and prayer gone into this, and uh, we're looking very forward to it. Amen. All right, uh, second announcement is that uh, we won't be posting any new lessons uh, the week of March 18th and 19th. That's Monday, March 18th, Tuesday, March 19th, two weeks from uh, today. Uh, We will be coming back at that point from our uh, annual Bible Prophecy Conference in Lexington, Kentucky, which will be the previous Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at the Palomar Baptist Church, where our good friend uh, Joe Moore is pastor. So we ask that you be in prayer for that. We'll be there again Friday through Sunday, March 15th through 17th, and we'll be teaching on the subject of the destiny of Israel's neighbors. We're going to, Lord willing, cover topics such as the Israel-Hamas war, the uh, judgment against Israel's neighbors, including the destruction of Damascus, the judgment upon Egypt, We'll cover as well uh, the Saudi-Iranian migrant crisis, or do we now have to call it the newcomer crisis? Some of you know what I'm talking about. And then we'll also uh, mention the War of Psalm 83, if not actually teach an entire lesson on that as well, because that's really the consummation of the judgment of Israel's neighbors. So be in prayer for that conference. Pray for the Palomar Baptist Church and Pastor Joe Moore. Make make them a part of your uh, daily, regular pray, prayers. Um, they, they really could use it, my friends. So um, they're good folks, great church. Pray for them. Add them to your prayer list, okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll begin our study in Daniel chapter 3 tonight. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you saved us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus, and that because we have him, we don't need anything else. We really don't. He he is all-sufficient for every need that we have, and we praise you for so great a salvation, for giving us, through your Son, your unspeakable gift. And we ask, Lord, that you would be with us tonight as we teach the Word of God, as we've gathered together virtually tonight. We pray that your 
Your presence would be manifest among us, Lord. You said where two or three were gathered together, that there you would be in the midst of them. And even though we're, it's not a physical gathering, it's a virtual one, we pray that, that you'd honor that, that, uh, that promise, Lord. I ask that you fill me with your Spirit and use me tonight to teach the Word of God, because if, if you're not the one who's in me and through me teaching the Word, Lord, if it's me that's doing the teaching, then all this is in vain. So we pray for the power and the filling of the Spirit tonight. We pray you'd meet each need represented out there, Lord, whether it be physical, financial, or spiritual. And bless your people. May you, you present yourself to them, show yourself to them a very present help in their time of trouble, Lord. Help us to be courageous and faithful in these last days. Serve you right up until the trump sounds or you call us home, Lord. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, Daniel chapter 3 is where we're at. We're talking about the friends and the furnace. The friends and the furnace. And we left off at verse number 6 last time, right? Uh, we'll begin reading at verse number 5 because I do have a, just a small update from something we taught you from verse 5 before we jump into verse 6. So Daniel 3 and verse number 5, this is the herald that's calling out crying out and giving this mandate to worship the image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. And this herald is a type of the false prophet in the tribulation. And he says in verse number, well, we'll start in verse 4, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up, and whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. All right, so if they fall down and worship at the sound of the music, everything's fine. But if not, it's capital punishment time. Now, last week, as well as I believe the, the week before, we talked about the impact of music, how music is often used as a an icebreaker, a warm-up act, if you will, for the main event in many public events, including dedications such as this one uh, regarding the golden image uh, that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Music uh, has its origins in fr from God himself. Um, but if, if you want to look at the first choir, the first demonstration of music or singing, you go back to creation. You go back to Genesis 1-1 and the account of that given to us in Job 38 and verse number 7, where it talks about all the sons of God shouting for joy and the morning stars singing together. A reference to the angels of God who had just been newly created, and they were singing as God uh, created the earth. He laid the foundations of the earth. And leading that praise of God and singing of those praises to him was none other than the anointed cherub Lucifer himself. We learn this from Ezekiel 28 verses 13 through 14. And we saw from Isaiah 14 verse 11, Ezekiel 28 verse 13, that Lucifer has a built-in sound system, if you will. God created the devil in his pre-fallen state to ha naturally have music emanating from him. Uh, reference in Isaiah to his vials, which is stringed instrument. Ezekiel 28, 13, his tabrets and his pipes. So you're talking about a percussion instrument and a wood instrument there. So, I'm sorry, wind instrument, I said wood, wind instrument. So Lucifer is the first songwriter, if you will. But when he falls, his music falls with him. And so he is truly the author of all godless music throughout the history of man. And again, we cannot underestimate the impact and influence that music has upon human society all over the world. 
And so I know I'm, I'm rehashing something that we've spoken about t- at least twice already. But I'm doing that because we have an update to bring you. Okay, so here's the scriptures again, Isaiah 14, verse 11 and 12, showing that Lucifer had vials, the anointed cherub, which is Lucifer in his pre-fallen state, had tabrets and pipes. But this from Breitbart News this past week. There's an Irish singer named Shane Lynch, and Shane Lynch professes to be saved. I don't know if Shane Lynch is truly born again or not. I don't know. I know he professes to have had a born-again experience, that he's not who he used to be. And based on what I read about him, he used to be a pretty dark individual involved in a lot of... of uh, occultic activities, and and the music that he was into also, likewise, very, very dark. Well, he has, uh, not just this past week, but historically accused uh, musicians of engaging either willingly or ignorantly in various satanic rituals through their performances, okay? And this past week, he railed another accusation, this time towards probably the most popular musician, artist, on the planet, namely Taylor Swift. I'm going to read the article to you, and and this is not to bash Taylor Swift or to promote Shane Lynch, but I want you to listen to what Lynch says about music, because it ties right back to what we've been telling you the past two weeks. The article goes on to say pop star Taylor Swift has been accused of performing demonic rituals at her concerts during her era's tour by Irish singer Shane Lynch, who said that the bad blood singer might not even realize what she's doing. And so that's why I don't want to make any direct or personal accusations myself. What I can say and I have no problem committing to saying this, is that every artist who achieves the celebrity, fame, and success that people like Elvis Presley, who professed to be a Christian, the Beatles, um, the Rolling Stones, Michael Jackson, um, Madonna, Um, Beyonce, uh, and even now the present-day Taylor Swift. Any group or individual that achieves that level of success has at the very least had to make some very important compromises. I'm not going to accuse them of making a bargain with the devil himself. I'm not going to do that. I don't know. But I know that to be at the head of the table of pop music, knowing biblically who the who the originator of godless music is, and when I say godless, I'm talking about any music that takes your mind and heart away from Jesus Christ. Music that does not lift up and glorify the Lord. Satan's the author of all that music. And so you can't be successful in this world, in that kind of music, regardless of what genre it is. You can't be successful without the devil giving you the nod of, the, nod of approval. I believe that. So now whether that means that These people are now occultists, Satanists, and actually and overtly conduct satanic rituals willingly. I can't say that. I'm sure some do. I'm also sure, as Shane Lynch allows for the possibility of, that some are doing it, but are doing it ignorantly. They have no idea what they're doing. They're just parroting uh, what others tell them to do or what others are doing. I, I, I don't know but you cannot achieve the level of a success that they are without getting Satan's nod of approval as the god of this world and the the author of godless music. 
So with that said, continuing with the article, I think when you're looking at a lot of the artists out there, Shane Lynch speaking, a lot of their stage shows are satanic rituals live in front of 20,000 people without them realizing and recognizing, Lynch told Ireland's Sunday World. The former Boy's Own singer added, now watch this, you'll see a lot of hoods up and masks on and fire ceremonies. So what he's telling you, being a former Satanist, that those things are satanic rituals, whether the artists realize it or not. Even down to Taylor Swift, one of the biggest artists in the world, I would argue the biggest. You watch one of her shows and she has two or three different demonic rituals to do with the pentagrams on the ground, to do with all sorts of stuff on her stage, he said. I couldn't find any images online from Taylor Swift concerts that show pentagrams on her stage. I did find what you're looking at now, her wearing a hooded garment and a and a cobra set up on the stage. So all of that certainly, certainly isn't godly. Certainly isn't. So, but then again, um, again, not to disparage her and not others, because what she's doing isn't much different from just about everybody out there. And again, since they're singing music that is not intended to draw you close to God and lift up the name of Jesus, you shouldn't be surprised. You just shouldn't be surprised. Now, if those artists are professing Christians, as in this case Taylor Swift professes to be, then that's something between them and the Lord. They need to, they need to really look at that. But back to the article. But to a lot of people, it's just art. And that's how people are seeing it, unfortunately. And we agree. So, and Christians who listen to this music are just fluffing it off. It's, it's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Because it's drawing you, your children, your grandchildren, away from the Lord. And, and two, dark thoughts. Okay. The Christian also told Sunday World that certain music is a danger to society. Amen. Because musicians are channeling the devil right before everyone's eyes. Lynch also noted that he has personally seen satanic rituals during his time in the music industry that involve praying over albums to ensure they are successful. I don't doubt that for a minute. The former Boy's Own singer went on to say that he himself has stopped listening to certain music as he believes that particular beats can have an impact on people. Amen. When it comes to a lot of the music that's out there at the moment, more of the hip-hop side of things, there is a lot of hidden satanic and a lot of evil within them, including down to the beats. It's very real, he said. We told you that. That, that has its origins going back to the sacrificing of children in the fire to Moloch with that incessant, increasing drum beat as the child was drawn into the iron furnace in the belly of the image of Moloch. Okay? Now watch this. Lynch says, Music attaches to your emotions. It has a connection to your spirit and how you feel. That's why I've stopped listening to those types of music myself, because it doesn't suit my spirit. Lynch also claimed that certain music is damaging to society in general, especially when it comes to children. It's coming in right at our children from the very beginning to get them to sway away from anything godly. Amen. That's it. Anything controlled or disciplined. Now, we can go on and read more. We'll just leave it at that. But folks, spot on. Spot on. So again, from one born-again believer to another, if you're listening to any music, if, and you've got to be honest with yourself, you've got to be honest with yourself, because if you're not honest with yourself, you'll never, you'll never get past this. But being honest with yourself, if the music you are listening to or you're allowing your children or grandchildren to listen to that are under your care is not music that very clearly, clearly is gospel music. It speaks about and lifts up the name of Jesus and draws the listener closer to the Lord, gets you to think about biblical things, spiritual things, godly things. 
if you can't say it, the music you're listening to does that, you need to stop listening to it. Full stop. Okay? I'm not trying to meddle. I'm trying to help you. And I can say this, but because before I got saved, I was a Catholic in name only, a nominal Catholic. I was not a faithful one because my religion was music. I worshipped it. I was addicted to it. I know the power it has. I know what it can make you do. Okay? So, just stop it. Ask the Lord to help you. Repent. Turn from it. Okay? You won't regret listening to good godly music. Ask the Lord to help you to, to find what what you can what you can listen to okay but please stop all right now to daniel daniel 3 verse number 6 so all is well if the folks fall down at the sound of the music so when the band strikes up and that six piece band starts to play and you fall down and worship the image all is good but if not you're going to be taken into custody and you're going to be executed for it. So whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour. So we're talking about, you want to talk about a speedy trial. I mean, it's because there is no trial. <laughs> they're, they're obviously disobeying the edict publicly. There's no need for a trial. They will be taken into custody and immediately executed by being cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. We've talked about how this typifies what's going to happen in the tribulation, with the lone exception that in the tribulation, people are not going to be forced to worship the image of the beast. The false prophet doesn't force anybody. Yes, it says in Revelation 13, verses 15 through 17, that the false prophet is going to cause that as many as don't worship the image of the beast are to be killed. But there's a big difference between causing people to be killed and coercing them. And the best example I can think of there, as far as causing versus coercing, you don't have to think too far back. Just go back to the COVID-19 mandates, okay? And how people who were reluctant and hesitant to getting the vaccine were basically... They were caused to get it because they might lose their jobs. So there wasn't a law passed that made it illegal to refuse the vaccine, but people were herded up and pretty much led into a singular direction, weren't they? They were caused to get it. Okay. Uh, so now what we want to point out here is another form of Babylonian capital punishment. We saw the first one back in chapter 1, verse 10, which is decapitation, where it says in Daniel 1, verse 10, And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your face as worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. So obviously, decapitation. The chopping block was a form of capital punishment in Babylon. Well, here's the second type, and that is being burned alive in a fiery furnace. It's not just here in Daniel 3, by the way. The first appearance, canonically, is in Jeremiah 29, in verse number 22, where it says, And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of Judah, which are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab. Now, the Zedekiah there is not King Zedekiah. The Ahab there is not the former king of Israel, Ahab. Different Zedekiahs and Ahabs, but nevertheless, people who were known at the time, they were renowned for something, and what was it? They were burned alive by Nebuchadnezzar. It says, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. That's what is going to happen to any and all who refused to bow down and worship this image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. 
So Babylonian form of capital punishment, decapitation, and burning in a fiery furnace. There's other forms of capital punishment mentioned in the Bible. Of course, the Jewish form of capital punishment was either by hanging or, by, most notably, by stoning. Find that in Leviticus 20, verse 2. Um, right here in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 7, we see a form of capital punishment used by the Medes and Persians, specifically the Medes, which was casting somebody into a den of lions. That's in Daniel 6, verse 7. The Medes and Persians also used hanging. That was primarily the, the Persians. You find that in Ezra 6, verse 11, and Esther 2, verse 13. You, of course, we know the Romans um, utilized crucifixion as well as decapitation. John the Baptist had his head chopped off. Jesus was crucified. So John 18.32 for crucifixion. And in the tribulation, we know that the revised Roman Empire is going to bring back the guillotine, the chopping block. In Revelation 20, verse 4, John saw the souls of them that were beheaded for Jesus. So the saints are going to be hunted down in the tribulation by the Antichrist and have their heads chopped off. So various forms of capital punishment throughout the Bible, all quite brutal, frankly. Today, uh, lethal injection is the most common, far more humane, I suppose. Um, hanging is still used. Um, a firing squad is also used. These all produce quick deaths, quick deaths for the most part. All right, so let's talk about this fiery furnace. Can we go back to the previous slide, please? Because you see and one artist's depiction of what this fiery furnace in Babylon might have looked like. You see that it's pretty tall there. You see the smoke coming out of vents there at the very top. You see that there's at least one uh, set of stairs ascending to an opening in the side of the furnace where presumably, presumably um, the people who are guilty of being executed are cast. Um, but this furnace could also serve a dual purpose, and its primary purpose may have been to smelt metals, such as gold, as in the gold used to make this image that we're seeing dedicated here. Okay, So you see that there's a, 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 an entrance here on one side and on another side. And you see the flames emerging from that side, flames and smoke emerging from the top vents. I point this out because based upon the description and the wording of Daniel 3, I believe that this furnace absolutely had some sort of ventilation and opening, or entry, I should say, at the top, but also had an entry or door in at least one side, maybe more than one side, and that it also probably had a ramp or stairs that led from ground level to the very least the top, if not also the side entry. Okay, we'll explain all that as we come across the verses that relate to that, okay? But what we do want to say about the furnace right now is that most renderings given of it, I don't believe, comply with what I believe is, is uh, clearly described here in Daniel 3. We'll point that out as we go along the way. Most of them depict, uh, for example, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being cast into an opening right there in the side of the furnace. And we're going to see that that's very unlikely. Very unlikely. Most depict this furnace almost like a, um, like a, a, a very large stove. Um, this furnace, and that's why I like this, this picture you're looking at right now, this furnace was in 
by our current our current terminology industrial sized it, it was commercial sized okay as we said possibly used for smelting metals and bake baking bricks it may have even been used to 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 melt the gold to forge the image that we're reading about here in Daniel 3 and uh, i'll say this now um Again, but no other reason to reiterate. The construction of this furnace was such that it had an opening at the top to allow smoke to release and vent out, and at least one other opening in the side where metals and other objects were cast or slid into the furnace to be burned. I believe the side opening, or if there was more than one side opening, that they each had a door or doors that could be opened or closed. We'll see that in verse 23 when we get there. One thing I can say with with good assurance, this furnace, since it's a form of capital punishment, it's a picture of hell. It's a picture of hell. You say, why, why do I say that? Because in Matthew 13... Matthew 13, I believe, is where it's at. Uh, Maybe not. Maybe I got the wrong scripture. Hold on just a second here. Just type in this key word, and we'll get the exact reference for you. How's that? Um, It is Matthew 13. I just must have misread it. Matthew 13, verse 42. That's why I was looking at verse 52, and it's 42. Uh, And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Verse 50, shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, referring to, to hell, the lake of fire. It's called the furnace of fire. So I have no doubt that since this is a form of capital punishment, it pictures hell. And when somebody is cast into hell, they're cast down into hell. It's not a lateral move. It's definitely vertical. It's down. Okay? So let's take a look at some other images here, shall we? Here's one. Here's one that is supposed to be the actual furnace. This is located in Iraq. And those who discovered this, the archaeologists who discovered this, believe it actually is the furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into. And I will say, and I I don't know that we have uh, a very clear um, size comparison here, but it looks like it is about the right size. I would say it's minimally the right size. It certainly has an opening right here. It looks like it would have had uh, probably a dual door here with a separation right here in the middle, one door to the left, one door to the right, that opened up where you could put um, metals to be burned and so forth. Um, There's an opening at the top, I believe, as well, and there looks to be some way to get to the top from the sides. Let me show you a very crude illustration of what I'm thinking this thing looked like. It's right here. So very similar to the previous one, right? Let's take a look at the two. Right, Pretty similar. So you have an opening at the top. Okay, much like there's, an, there's mo- probably more than one opening on this earth that ends up in the pits of hell. All right, Um, we read in Revelation 9 how the bottomless pit is open and smoke comes out of the pit, like the smoke of a furnace. Well, so here you have this top opening to this burning fiery furnace, and it serves as a vent. So out comes the smoke and any flames that are pouring out. There's a, on top, there's a platform. You see, we have ramps over here going to the side where in this case you see we have Nebuchadnezzar and some armed guards sitting over here to witness 
Um, in this case, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being cast in by these uh, guards over here that have taken them into custody. They're going to be cast down into the furnace. And it can't be deep enough so that when they're cast in, because they're bound, that when they're cast in, they die from the fall itself. Okay? Because the idea is burn them to death. So this allows for it to be tall enough to be considered a fire pit, if you will, but not too tall where, as they're cast in, when they reach the bottom, they're going to die from the fall itself. We have an opening in the side here. You see these two doors can open up and metals could be put in or something can be taken out. And that's what I believe happens in verse 23. So we'll cover all this in more detail as we go. But point being, there's an opening at the top that's used for ventilation, but also for casting the guilty into. There's a side opening, at least one, with door or doors on it for placing metals or bricks into, and also for removing the remains of those who are burned alive. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, as the king, is going to be an eyewitness to the execution, so there has to be a way of getting from ground level to the top. So there's ramps or stairs leading to the top on each side. So that's my best guess of what this thing looked like. Okay. All right, so back to Daniel 3. Daniel 3, verse number 7, Therefore at what time, but therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So what's interesting here in the list of musical instruments in verse 7, there's only five of them mentioned. The dulcimer is omitted. Okay. Everything else is mentioned, cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all those instruments, including the dulcimer, are mentioned in verses 10 and 15 as well as verse 5. But for some reason, dulcimer omitted here in verse 7. I don't think that's a mistake. I don't know why, but I know it's not a mistake. So the music starts up and it says, All the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image. All except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of course. They don't. So the image you're looking at right now shows how that must have looked. They stood out like a sore thumb. All of the principals, all the leaders from all the provinces, in whatever position they hold, they're all fallen down. Just three are not. And they're all together in one place. They stick out like a sore thumb. So the cliche is, it goes, they fell for it. So the music plays, they fall down. We mentioned last week there's a cliche, face the music. And that cliche usually means it's time to, it's decision time, right? Well, here uh, we can use the cliche, they fell for it. And this is a great example of how quickly and easily masses of people will do whatever, and I mean whatever, the government tells them to do when they fear for their lives. Any government that wants to cause as opposed to coerce their people to do something, and we mentioned an example just a while ago with the COVID restrictions, we did. The government was behind that. So if a government wants to cause people to do something that they want, as opposed to coerce them, because that wouldn't be legal in our country. In some countries, it's they do that legally. But here it's not legal, but they still want the same effect. All they have to do is gin up fear. Gin up fear. Do you remember all the fear regarding the virus that was ginned up? I do. I hope you, I hope you do too. I hope you never forget it. Because while we certainly needed to be cautious, while we certainly needed 
to respond with respect and all of that. <sighs> Folks, there was a lot of what is called um, fear-mongering going on, okay? A lot of it. Too many people died, that is for certain. Too many people are still dying, okay? But the fear that was instilled was all in an effort to get people to do something that they otherwise probably wouldn't have done. Okay? We'll leave it at that. What I saw in this was a precursor of the Mark of the Beast. It, it, again, we, we had to say, because so many were saying it was the Mark of the Beast, we had to say it's not, but it certainly is a picture of what's going to happen and how the false prophet is going, by, by deception, going to be able to cause people to willingly, joyfully take the mark of the beast and disparage those who refuse it. And we know from Scripture, those people will, behind the scenes, actually be hunted down and executed for their refusal. So the point here being, it takes uncompromising conviction and courage that is demonstrated here by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stand against such things and not be one of the sheeple and just go with the crowd out of fear. Out of fear, because sheep are very easily scared. Very easily scared. They're very skittish creatures. They're very jumpy, very, you know, as far as quick to be scared, and that's how we are. It takes courage and conviction to stand. And this is a picture of what's going to happen on a global level when the image of the beast and the mark of the beast is instituted, Revelation 13. All right, so uh, they all fall down and worship the golden image, except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Wow. Wow. All right, so we're going to stop there. We'll stop there for tonight. We'll pick up on verse number eight. We'll see the the uh, the officers, the Jews, or the, I'm sorry, the Chaldeans' response to the Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's refusal next time. Uh, before we go, we just want to take a little bit of time, as we always do at this time, uh, for those who are not 100% certain that they're saved, to give you the gospel, to give you an opportunity to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Uh, let me give you the bad news and then the good news of the situation regarding our souls. The bad news is, is that we're all guilty sinners under the penalty of eternal death. That's according to God's Word. As far as being guilty sinners, Romans 3 verse 23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, we're not going to get into heaven unless we don't have any sin. God is not going to allow a single sin into heaven. And so we've all come short of the glory of God. That means we're all guilty sinners. And now we're subject to the penalty for being sinners. And that penalty, according to Romans 6.23, is death. Where it says in the first part of the verse, the wages of sin is death. It's not just physical death, though. Because sin is not always committed through the body. Some sins are, but not all sins. But what is certain about all sins is that they originate spiritually. They originate in our nature, in our heart. And so whether that sin is just thought of and committed to in our mind and heart, but never carried out in the body, it's still committed spiritually. And because of that, because all sin is spiritual, then the penalty for said sin is also spiritual death. Separation from God in a place called hell in the lake of fire. Psalm 917 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell. And Revelation 21 8 says, The unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So that's the bad news according to God's word. And there's not a thing that you and I can do to erase this in and of ourselves. We can't. 
But the good news is, is that God can, and he did. The good news is, is that God so loved you and me and saw that we, there was nothing we could ever do to save ourselves. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to be born of a virgin over 2,000 years ago, live a sinless life for 33 and a half years, and then he died spiritually and physically on an old rugged cross, paying the penalty, paying the price for your sins and mine. He suffered what amounted to an eternity of torment in hell for you and me, and then willingly gave up his physical life. He was buried for three days and rose again after three days, proving that he had power over death, hell, and the grave, that his sacrifice on the cross paid for our sins in full. Now that's love. Romans 5.8 and John 3.16 speak of this love and the deliverance that comes from what Jesus did on the cross. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So since that price for our sins has been paid for in full by Jesus, Eternal life is now available for any and all who who want it. But here's the condition. We have to come through Jesus Christ. The last part of Romans 6.23 says, The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't get eternal life by getting baptized We don't get eternal life by joining a church or some other religion. We don't get eternal life by making sure our good works outweigh our bad again. Nothing short of the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from our sins. Romans 1, verse 5 and 6. He he hath washed us from our sins in his own blood. And that only comes when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, when we place our faith and trust in him, as our Savior. As it says in Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The result, thou shalt be saved. That's the good news. You can be saved and have a home in heaven here tonight if you're just willing to admit that you're a lost sinner deserving of hell and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day and ask him to forgive you of your sins and save you, are you willing to do that tonight? Then pray with me now. Dear God in heaven, I confess that I'm a lost sinner, and I do deserve to go to hell. I believe your word, Lord. But thank you for loving me so much, for sending your only begotten Son, Jesus, to pay that awful price for me. And Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much to pay such a price. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe you rose again the third day. And I believe if I asked you to save me, you could and you would. And so the best way I know how, I'm placing my trust, my faith in you. I'm asking you to forgive me of all of my sins. Come into my heart and save my soul. Give me the gift of eternal life. I'm putting my trust in you and you alone to get me to heaven. In your name I pray. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer and meant it, it's not the words that save you, it's the faith that saves you. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The moment you asked him to save you, in faith, he saved you. Take him at his word, okay? All right, our time is come and gone, folks. Uh, We'll be back, Lord willing, next Monday and Tuesday for Mount Pleasant Bible Institute study and Tuesday Night Prophecy. Uh, You keep us in your prayers as we pray for you. We love you and appreciate you, okay? So until next time, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Put on the whole armor of God and be steadfast, unmovable, and always abound in the work of the Lord. Here's a little bit more of our choir. 
I got saved. Until next time.